If only financial planning was as simple as buying an asset that provides a high and predictable rate of return. Unfortunately, such an asset does not exist. If it did, then everyone would buy it, which would drive up its price until it could no longer offer high rates of return. Here's a picture of how the cornerstone asset recommended by most financial experts has performed over the past half century. This is how $100 invested in the S&P 500 in 1970 has grown over the past 50 years with dividends invested. The drag of taxes has been ignored. Notice that the actual return of a person who was able to hold for 50 years was pretty good. Over 50 years, the CPI adjusted return was 6.3% per year. Of course, the big problem was that over shorter periods of time, the return was quite unpredictable. The person who bought in 1970, but needed the money 13 years later, found out that there was no return at all. A person who bought in 1982 had quite a different experience. If we draw a trend line, we can see that the average experience was a 7.1% per year rate of return. But nobody can really count on that return in their planning. And this is the main reason why people tend not to buy stocks at the exclusion of everything else. There is a significant amount of risk. This risk can be seen by looking at the deviations from the actual returns around the trend line. The bigger the deviations, the less predictable is the performance of the asset. Of course, this is not a risk for someone who only intends to spend the dividends, but most regular savers will find that they need to spend their capital in retirement, which makes adverse price movements very dangerous. Financial experts and academics have approached this problem by suggesting that a person blend in bonds as a way to reduce volatility. And this works to reduce volatility and thus improve predictability, but it also sacrifices long-term returns. And one has to expect that. But few people ask the question, why bonds? Are there other ways to reduce volatility? I argue that the answer is yes. One can use gold. Let me show you why the experts miss the incredible utility that gold has for improving the predictability of returns. I've shown this graph before in previous videos. It shows the correlation coefficient between bonds, stocks, and gold over various holding times. If we focus on the left-hand side of the graph, we can see that over short periods of time, bonds are indeed only weakly correlated with stocks. And this is why financial experts recommend their use. Gold is not correlated at all over the short term. In fact, it is weakly negatively correlated. Why don't financial experts suggest using gold blended with stock? It has to do with the fact that gold is a lot more volatile than bonds and doesn't pay interest. And so they assume that it won't do as good a job. Of course, financial firms don't make any commissions from you when, they sell, when you buy gold. But we'll ignore that for now and give the experts the benefit of the doubt that they are being on the level. But what they miss is the behavior as we move out to longer and longer holding periods. Notice that without rebalancing, the correlation between bonds and stocks grows, and the negative correlation between gold and financial assets also grows. This is a very interesting property that isn't properly analyzed with simplistic statistical models and so it gets ignored. But you and I, knowing this property of gold, can take advantage of it, provided, of course, that we're prepared to ignore mainstream financial advice. What this suggests is that not only is gold useful as a tool to make a portfolio return more predictable, but it also suggests that rather than rebalancing frequently, we should rebalance gradually to take advantage of the tendency of gold to move opposite to financial assets over longer time periods. Let's explore this further. First, I'll remind everyone how gold can improve portfolio predictability. I've said many times in the past that the percentage of gold that minimizes the volatility of a stock-heavy portfolio is 35%. Here I'm illustrating how a 35% gold plus 65% stock portfolio has performed over the past half century. It is shown here in blue to contrast against the pure S&P 500 holding shown in black. The gold and stock portfolio is rebalanced each year. Although the mixed portfolio actually produced a return of 6.9% per year in CPI-adjusted terms, I would suggest ignoring that 
since the beginning of the 1970s was a great time to buy gold. What matters more is the trend line, which will tell you what the average experience of a person who bought a 35%, 65% mix would have been if they had uh, bought it at various times over the past five decades. The swope of the trend line says that the average performance was 6.2% per year, not 6.9%. This is almost a full percentage point off of what the average experience was in the S&P 500. However, notice how much more predictable the performance has been. There were no full decades of bad performance like there were with just the pure S&P 500 holding. So from that standpoint, gold did quite a nice job reducing risk without sacrificing much in the way of return. But we can do better knowing what we know about the correlations that we saw on the previous slide. What happens if instead of rebalancing at the end of every year, we observe, um, observe how out of balance the portfolio is and only make a partial correction? This will have the benefit of allowing the winner and loser to run a little bit longer to take advantage of the ability to sell high and buy low. This chart shows how predictability of the portfolio, which is shown on the x-axis as the deviation around the trend line, is related to the average yearly return shown on the y-axis, is influenced by the extent to which the portfolio is rebalanced at the end of each year. The blue curve is a 35% gold, 65% stock mix. The red curve is for a 25% gold mix. The green curve is for a 15% gold mix. The black point is a pure S&P 500 holding. The purple curve I threw in just for the sake of completeness. It is a 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio. We can see something astounding here in the gold and stock mixes. The minimum risk is generally associated with fully rebalancing every year. But when we don't fully rebalance the portfolio, the return goes up, at least at first, without making the returns any more risky. In fact, for holdings of 25% gold or less, Rebalancing a little less frequently not only improves the returns, but also reduces the risk. We can see that for the 35% gold and 65% stock portfolio, that we can actually improve the returns by about half a percent without adding much in risk by rebalancing only one third of the way at the end of each year. In other words, suppose that at the end of any given year we find that the gold percentage has increased to 41 percent and the stock percentage has decreased to 59 percent each asset is off by six percent rather than bringing things completely back into balance we would try to get one third of the way back sell enough gold to bring its percentage to 39 percent and use the proceeds to buy stock i'll show you how this improves the big picture on the next slide the purple curve shows that for a blend of stocks and bonds, delaying the rebalancing doesn't help at all. It only increases the risk. We should expect that because we notice that the correlation between stocks and bonds grows with time, thus the need to rebalance frequently. Notice an astounding thing here. The green curve, representing a blend of 15% gold and 85% stock, had points that did a little better than pure stocks from a return standpoint at significantly less risk than the 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio, which is the stalwart champion of the financial industry. The trick is to only go 20-30% to of the way towards rebalancing at the end of each year. Look at that gold shine. Now let's go back to the 35% gold and 65% stock portfolio and see what, how well it has done over the past half century if it is only rebalanced a third of the way each year. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the asymptotically rebalanced gold and stock portfolio shown in red. It came very close to matching the annual uh, returns of the pure S&P 500 holding with a fraction of the volatility. The return was within half a percent of the S&P 500. But unlike the S&P 500, there were no long stretches of bad performance. The fact that it is about half a percent per year better in returns than the continuously rebalanced 35% gold and stock mix without sacrificing predictability is quite helpful. 
it can help to offset some of the taxes that will be incurred in the rebalancing process, while at the same time reducing the taxes because of making less frequent moves. Asymptotic rebalancing, or partial rebalancing, really does improve returns when it comes to gold in a portfolio. And this helps to explain why the liquidation strategy I proposed a few videos back worked so well. That strategy was just to draw funds from the asset that was overweight rather than rebalance. I'm getting to the point where there is so much material on this channel and it is so spread out that I should probably consider writing a book or maybe even several books. It would probably help to consolidate the material and allow me to go into more depth. Well, I guess that's something else to put on the list.